Hello again, Cranky here with another wonderful video about my beloved homemade camper, Brutus. This time, we're going to delve into the actual building of the little ugly beast. I'll tell you about the materials I used, why I used them, and hopefully, I'll remember to explain how I assembled them. No promises, though. I am the captain of a very leaky brain boat, so my memory is absolute shit. Some of this may seem redundant if you have viewed the tour video, and I may leave out things that I mentioned there. Some quick facts before we get crack-a-lacking. Brutus has three solar panels producing 300 watts of power. It stores this energy in three large automotive batteries. It can hold approximately 43 gallons of fresh water. It has a 30-gallon black tank. He has been in storage about 3,000 miles away for over a year and a half because I don't have the means to retrieve him, which is why I cannot create new content. I sometimes refer to Brutus as he instead of it. Deal with it. In the beginning, I wasn't looking to build a camper. I've been watching a lot of videos about tiny houses and the concept struck a chord in me. I love the idea of small, affordable living. I have nothing to prove to anyone or feel the need to impress strangers. I don't need a McMansion in the suburbs or the newest car. I would be wonderfully comfortable and content in a tiny house planted on a small plot of land. Being that I was working for a municipality at the time, I had ready access to the building and code enforcement guys. I told them I wanted to build a tiny house on a 30-foot trailer, buy a piece of wooded land, and live happily ever after. They made it very clear that by town code, any home had to be at least 600 square feet, and that if a dwelling is on wheels, it would be considered a mobile home, and therefore could only be parked in a trailer park. Well, sh I'm a little foggy on how the dead dream of living in a tiny house evolved into building Brutus, quitting my job, and wandering off to the great wherever. I think it was a combination of being a generally unhappy person, wanting to attempt the nomadic lifestyle after watching possibly hundreds of YouTube videos posted by van lifers, sailors, and vagabonds, as well as wanting something original and unique. Let me make this clear. I didn't build a camper because I wanted to go camping. I hate camping. Well, I hate the camping normal people do. I think it's dreadful and boring. Perhaps I'll do a video on that subject at another time. But I digress. I spent a lot of time, mostly while at work, writing a list of things I wanted on my camper. So here we go. As I stated in the tour video that you likely didn't watch, and I don't blame you, I wanted a toilet, a flushing toilet, not a goddamn bucket. No disrespect intended toward the bucket shitters out there. I needed solar power because Brutus was meant to be an off-grid, boondocking machine, not something you squeeze between other campers in those awful treed parking lots people refer to as campgrounds. Yuck. Along with solar power, I would need an inverter so I could have AC power for my computers, television, Xbox, and other monitored amenities. Just because you're heading off to nature, it doesn't mean you have to live like a caveman, huddling in the dark, playing with your own poo for entertainment. I wanted running water for a basic sink and my toilet, so I'd need to have a fresh water tank and a water pump. Storage space. No matter how much stuff you get rid of, there are still things you'll either need or you'll want to bring along. When you're planning your own build, whether it be a towable camper like Brutus or a van, Always be thinking storage. It becomes a valuable commodity when you're living in a tiny space. Don't forget about heat. I'm from upstate New York, so having a heat source is just a given. If you're from anywhere with harsh winters, you're probably thinking, duh. But a lot of people hit the road assuming they'll be able to simply avoid anywhere cold and miserable. It's not that easy. I was camping on the beach in Louisiana, and I mean on the beach. Brutus was parked about 100 feet from the lapping, salty waters of the Gulf of Mexico. One morning, I awoke to see everything covered in snow. My friend in Mississippi messaged me to complain about the wintry weather and said something like, You damn Yankee, you brought this down here with you. The point being, I had my little propane heater and I was toasty inside Brutus while I waited for Mother Nature to get her sh** together outside. Along the same lines as heat, you'll also need a lot of ventilation 
and a roof vent fan to assist the transfer of heat to the grate outdoors. In my experience, it is much more difficult to maintain the temperature inside when the sun is pounding down than it is when it's chilly outside. Think of living in a tiny space like walking down the street. If it's cold, you can put on a jacket and stay reasonably comfortable. If it's hot, you can only take off so much clothing before the police show up, beat you with sticks, and haul you off to your friendly neighborhood nut hut. Invest in a good vent fan. I didn't. I bought a really cheap one, and it was basically useless. On the hottest days, I lounged in bed nude for hours at a time. Not a pretty picture, I know. Now that you have the image of a miserable, sweaty, middle-aged man lying nude in bed in your head, let's get on with the story. When I committed to building Brutus, I needed to squeeze in all the features I wanted, but it also couldn't be too heavy. It had to be towed by a 2003 Dodge Durango, and I think its max towing capacity is in the area of 4,700 pounds. I also had to do it on the cheap. I didn't have any savings because I'm a real winner at life, so everything happened in stages. It slowly came together as I could afford to purchase materials. Here's what makes Brutus just a bit more interesting than other homemade campers. Sitting in my yard was a 1969 Chioli Sportster, a hulking 30-foot fiberglass motor yacht. I picked it up for free, fully intending on restoring it, but its structure was rotted, so I decided to harvest its organs for my homemade camper build. Yes, I know. I am a f***ing genius. The first thing I snagged was the boat's rusty triaxle trailer. I know what you're thinking, other than, this guy sounds dead sexy. You're thinking, in order for a 30-foot boat to fit on its trailer, the trailer has to be longer than 30 feet long. And, from the photos you've already seen, no way is Brutus 30 feet long. If you had watched the tour video, you would have learned that, in fact, Brutus is only 15 feet long. So what gives? Obviously, the trailer needed to be cut down to size. So I backed up the boat to a tree in my backyard, tied its rear to the tree, then dragged the trailer out beneath it. That tactic wasn't good for the trailer or the boat, but the tree didn't seem to care. Good tree. Now, the trailer was ready to be customized. Therefore, I immediately parked it in my yard and left it for a couple more months while I thought about my strategy. Eventually, after enough snow had accumulated upon the old trailer, I decided to drag it out of the yard so I could begin modifying it to meet my needs. In hindsight, there was nothing ideal about that big rusty trailer. It had been obviously homemade and was doubtfully ever perfect. Many years later, it hadn't improved. The tires were heavily dry rotted, the bearings were shot, and the old hydraulic brake system was well beyond repair. Using a simple grinder and a whole bunch of cutting wheels, I chopped off the front, the frontmost axle, and a lot of extra reinforcement pieces that were rendered redundant as the trailer would no longer be hauling a 12,000 pound boat. The resulting axle configuration wasn't perfect, but it would have to work. The camper's general layout was floating around in my head, but only in the most vague manner. There is a 60-40 rule that helps you plan the location of axles based on where the weight is going to be carried. Using that rule would have required more planning than I was prepared to commit to. So my outlook on the trailer was very much like what my parents said when they first laid eyes on me. I guess that'll have to do. I knew that I would eventually have to rebuild the tongue and buy a new hitch for the trailer, but rather than screw around with such trivialities, I decided to go ahead and begin playing with wood, which is something I have a lot of experience with. After the snow melted, I went to Lowe's and grabbed a bunch of 2x3s for my floor joists, a couple of 16-foot 2x4s to use as side plates, some wood glue, and I think 3-inch ceramic coated deck screws. The keen listeners are probably troubled by the idea of 2x3 floor joists, as you should be. It's ridiculous. However, those heavy steel rails on the trailer are only about 4 feet apart, and once everything is all glued and screwed together as a unit, there wasn't any bounce in the floor. Why not go bigger with the lumber? Wait. When you're building something for the road, you have to constantly think about the sum weight of the thing. Keep it light, my friends. I constructed my floor frame, slapped down some half-inch OSB, and was very pleased with myself indeed. The single largest piece of the old boat that I wanted to salvage was the dinette. It had a collapsible table and six drawers, all made from mahogany. 
I wanted to remove it from the boat as a single unit, which wouldn't be easy because it was built into the boat, and it seemed quite happy to die there. I cut off the boat's transom wall, yanked out the dead 350 Chevy engine, removed the nearly 8-foot wide sliding glass doors, and basically began beating the shit out of things until I could free the dinette. I eventually managed to remove the unit and plop it on the camper's floor deck. Because of its size and being generally unwieldy, I knew I had to get it into that camper before I built the walls. Speaking of walls, I am a very studly 5 foot 6 inches tall, so I built my walls to be 6 feet high. If you're taller than that, boo-hoo, you freak. You're not invited inside my playhouse anyway. The walls are all constructed of 2 by 2s 16 inches on center, and sheathed with Luon. The front wall was sheathed with half-inch OSB because it would be fighting the wind while in tow, and I needed something a little more substantial to mount utilities to. I added some diagonal bracing in all the corners to help keep Brutus stiff. Yes, you heard me. I wanted to keep Brutus stiff. It's important to note that every piece of wood is glued and screwed. The Luan... <laughs> f idiot dog. Anyway, the Luan on the side and rear walls was glued and fastened with one-inch crown staples. The OSB in the front wall was glued and screwed. Why? That's right. I wanted to keep Brutus stiff. You'll notice that I didn't frame in the window holes. You have to understand that I am a relatively impatient man, so I merely wanted to get things moving along. Also, at that point in the build, I had no idea what kind or size of windows I would install. At that point, I was still pricing windows that are intended for camper use. They were out of my price range, so I was at a loss. Do you see that little dark wooden beam in the roof? That was a mahogany ceiling beam from the boat. I wanted some shape to the roof anyway, and I had been looking at a ton of photos online of gypsy caravans, so I decided to go with a curved roof. There are two proper ways to create curved lumber. You can steam the lumber to make it pliable, or you can buy larger diameter lumber and cut it to the shape you require. I simply forced my little roof rafters into shape by screwing one end to the top plate of a side wall, then pushed it down slowly to be screwed to the opposing wall plate. Easy peasy. There was a modicum of cracking and complaining, but I didn't break any. I sheathed the roof with 3 8 plywood, again, glued and screwed. Somewhere along the way, I decided to rebuild the trailer's tongue. I didn't yet have my little 120 volt welder, so I bought four steel plates and a bunch of bolts to sort of band-aid the tongue onto the trailer so I could move it around when needed. I went through a lot of cheap drill bits while making holes for the steel band-aid. I did eventually, though badly, weld the plates to the trailer. I don't know how to weld, but I have never allowed my astounding level of ignorance to hold me back from doing something. I'm pretty sure I purchased the hitch coupler and jack on eTrailer.com, though I cannot guarantee that. As with any structure, you want to get it sealed from the weather as soon as possible. It was spring, and it seemed to be raining all the time. I mean fucking constantly. What a pain in the balls. Anyway. After a little research and a lot of staring at my empty bank account, I decided to cover Brutus in an application known as Poor Man's Fiberglass. It is a very simple process of gluing canvas to wood, allowing the glue to dry, then painting the whole damn thing. You could purchase new canvas by the roll, or you could do what I did. Take another trip to Lowe's and pick up a bunch of cheap drop cloths. Apparently, this system originated from a technique once used to cover the decks of boats, though I believe they used paint as the adhesive layer, not glue. I could be wrong. I very often am. It's really as uncomplicated as something could be. I purchased Type Bond 2 by the gallon. That's the glue that everyone seemed to suggest in my research, so I stuck with it. It works wonderfully. You pour the glue in a painter's roller pan, then roll that shit onto the wood. Quickly, you place the canvas onto the wet glue. If you put on a generous amount, you will be able to reposition the canvas a bit if you mess up. If you're like me, you'll need to immediately smooth out any bubbles and wrinkles with your hands. Next, allow it to dry. It could be dry in a couple of hours or the next day, depending on the temperature and level of humidity. Once it's dry, roll on the paint. Two important points. Canvas absorbs a lot of paint. I cannot stress that enough. The first coat will soak right in. 
You're painting fabric, not drywall. Be prepared to be unable to estimate the amount of paint required to truly cover the canvas. Secondly, use exterior paint, you f***ing idiot. I read someone's blog post about how they used interior paint on their attempt at poor man's fiberglass because they assumed that all paints are equal and it went to hell after the first rainfall. Stupid, blithering twat. Okay, for you slow learners, here is the process again. Cover the wood comprehensively with Type on 2. Quickly apply the canvas. Smooth out the bubbles and wrinkles before the glue dries. Allow it to dry. Paint your masterpiece with exterior paint. Magnifico. My first suggestion is this. Do at least two coats with a cheap exterior primer, then apply your final tinted paint on top. By the way, in case you're wondering why I chose the color I did, it's because I was perusing the area behind the Lowe's paint counter where they keep all of the rejected paints or mixed paints that customers didn't pick up, and I noticed a can of Valspar Storm Coat sitting there for nine bucks. It was cheap, it was brown, end of story. When I went back for more paint, I had them tint it the same color as the first nine dollar gallon. I mean, Brutus was never going to be fancy or pretty or fit in with the cool kids, so f*** it. I painted him brown. Now that the windowless hulk was mostly safe from incessant downpours in the rainforests of upstate New York, I would get to work on the inside. I yanked a couple more cabinets out of the old dilapidated boat and spruced up the mahogany a bit with some sort of magical wood restoring fluid. I can't remember what the hell it was. Then, I peeled off the old black laminate, not an easy task, and relaminated the tops with leftover laminate I had from remodeling my house's kitchen. They didn't look half bad. I tossed them inside Brutus, but didn't screw them in place quite yet. I was still working on my floor plan at that point, which was mostly being dictated by the crap I pulled from the boat. I had a lot going on at the same time inside the mighty Brutus. I was beginning to frame out where my full-size bed would be at the front, the walls for the bathroom, insulating the walls and ceiling, as well as slowly installing my solar energy system. I had a huge wish list on Amazon of all the components that I would need to make everything inside Brutus function, and I was ordering one or two things with every paycheck, it seemed. I loved coming home from work to find a newly delivered piece of my homemade camper. It was like having random birthday gifts being sent to me all the time. Oh look, I received a pack of six DC power ports. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Though I intended on having at least three solar panels, I couldn't afford them all at once, so I purchased a simple Renogy kit online, which consisted of a single 100 watt panel, their basic charge controller, and leads from the solar panel to the controller. I purchased an additional two panels when I was able to, I also installed a very basic voltage meter so I could monitor the amount of energy being stored. Installing a basic solar energy system is very simple, though I recall that little cheapo meter being a complete pain in the ass. The panels are mounted on the roof using Renogy Z brackets. I bolted them to the roof. I didn't screw them down. To clarify, there are nuts and washers on the underside of the roof's plywood. That way, it would require a hell of a lot of wind shear to yank off my panels as I'm heading down the road. Somewhere along the way, I decided that I really needed to get my shit together and finally install windows, despite not having much money for them. I had stored a lot of crap in the dungeon below my house, and I found my old wooden storm door down there. I cut it down to size and installed it horizontally in the dinette wall. The window is removable. It also leaks when it rains. So I f***ed that up. I got a cheap vinyl slider window from Lowe's and put that over the stove area. It works well and it doesn't leak. Chalk that up as a win for old Cranky. Booyah! I wired in five or six AC power outlets that could run off of my power inverter. I also got my hands on an AC-DC power selector switch so I could power Brutus from an external AC source such as a generator or any other outlet I could run a lead cord to. For those who don't know what an inverter is, it's basically a small magical box you connect to your batteries that can convert the DC power from the batteries to 110 volt household AC power. Without it, you can only use devices that use DC power. My inverter has two AC outlets on it, and the wiring for Brutus's AC outlets runs to both the inverter and to that funky little power selector switch on the outside. 
I pulled the gross old fiberglass water tank out of the old boat, ran a lot of bleach and water through it, then installed it in the storage space below the bed frame. I bought an inexpensive DC-powered water pump to supply the water to my sink and toilet. A lot of homemade builds use a manual hand pump for water. Screw that noise. Get yourself a $50 water pump. At this point, the interior of Brutus was an absolute shitstorm. My ex-wife and I were selling our house at the time, so I had to store a lot of the tools and materials I was using for the camper inside it. I was constantly juggling shit around in order to complete the massive punch list of projects left to be done. You'll notice that I didn't use that foil-covered glorified boil wrap as insulation, as so many people do. Well, they think they're using it as insulation, but it doesn't do that. It is not insulation by any stretch of the imagination. Since I studied everything 16 inches on center, I was able to buy R13 fiberglass insulation, pull it in half, and fill my wall and ceiling cavities with it. R13 fiberglass insulation is designed for 2x4 walls. My walls are 2x2s, so it made sense. You can't tear it apart in any precise manner due to its cotton candy composition, but it's a hell of a lot more effective than placing a thin sheet of bubble wrap in your wall and calling it a day. A lot of people who build campers or modify their vans for life on the road cover every interior surface with knotty pine. I'm not a fan of that look, and those planks add a lot of weight to your build. It simply wasn't the look I was going for. You'll notice that I used Luon for the interior surfaces, just as I did for the exterior. It's cheap, it's light, and it's flexible, which sounds a lot like the women I find most attractive. Most of the Luon was painted, though I covered the two end walls of the dinette with simple burlap. I attempted to paint the burlap on one of the walls, but it looked horrible. Huge mistake. I used tan paint in the main living areas, but I found a sort of teal color I had left over from some other project for the ceiling and main wall next to the dinette. For the ceiling of the main area, I went absolutely rogue. I grabbed a set of full-length curtains from my house and glued the fabric to the ceiling. I was a little anxious about it at first, but I really liked the end result. If you don't, well... You can go f yourself. I bought a 30 gallon black tank and a lovely plastic RV toilet. And I installed them in the tiny space I had cordoned off for the bathroom. I intended to fully cover that room in poor man's fiberglass, but never finished it. I did plumb the water so I could easily add a shower someday. I lived and traveled in Brutus for a continuous six months and showered maybe three times. You learn to take sponge baths, use wet wipes, and run outside naked when it begins to rain. If you have never stood naked in the rain, what the hell kind of life are you living? Next, I did the only logical thing and installed the bow hatch from my boat in the front wall of the camper. I did that for a variety of perfectly sound reasons. One wants all the ventilation you can get, and it would serve as a place for a small air conditioner if the need arose. Mostly, I thought it would be a cool and interesting feature. Obviously, I was correct. When my house sold, my camper wasn't yet ready for the road, and my good friend and neighbor, Tom, invited me to park Brutus in his backyard and even plug in my power to his garage so I could be comfortable and have everything I needed to finish the beast. So, my first days of actually living in Brutus were in a friend's backyard as fall began to descend. It was a good dry run, and I was able to get some important projects completed. When I moved Brutus from my yard to Tom's, the trailer coupler was only resting on the ball of my old Dodge Durango's hitch. The trailer's new coupler was for a two-inch ball, but the ball and mount that were permanently rusted to my hitch receiver were two and five sixteenths inches. Extracting that stubborn rusted prick was not easy, but with the help of a reciprocating saw, a big hammer, and a chisel, and a lot of PB blaster, I was able to kill the old hitch and insert the new 9-inch drop upside down with a 2-inch ball. I had to use a 9-inch drop upside down because Brutus's damn frame is so high compared to the Dur Durango's hitch. A few weeks later, I towed Brutus about 20 miles to a friend's secluded camp in order to live truly off-grid and get a sense of what I might still need to do before hitting the road as a full-time nomad. I installed a simple water access panel that allowed me to easily fill my 43-gallon water tank from the outside with a hose, just like a normal camper would. I added a trucker antenna to help get the best cell signal to my hotspot device, 
And finally, I made the decision to put new axles and tires on the old steel frame. The original brakes were hydraulic and completely seized. If you're towing anything of weight, you need additional braking. So I added electric disc brakes to the trailer and a, and a brake controller and the Durango. After truly loving my time at that beautiful place, Mother Nature told me that it was time to get my ass on the road. One night, as winter crept in, I awoke to the sound of spraying water, and it wasn't me pissing myself. Water had frozen in the water pump, burst the plastic housing, and it was emptying the water tank all over my camper and the stuff I had stored under my bed. I ordered a new pump, thawed and dried out my poor soaked Brutus, then hit the road immediately after receiving the pump in the mail. I was smart and didn't bother installing it until I was well away from the possibility of below freezing temps. I likely left out a lot of important details, so if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments section. Hugs and big wet kisses. Mwah. It's just the same bush over and over again, Maggie. You keep coming back to the same bush. It's a lot like being married.